Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have two speakers. Uh, and uh, today is a presentation from the world of psychiatry. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Postel, is uh, the co-lead uh, for infant and early childhood uh, mental health uh, here at CHEO. Uh, she's <clears throat> a child and adolescent psychiatry with subspecialty training in infant and preschool psychiatry. She has a special interest uh, in early childhood mental health, particularly in the area of prevention and early prevention. Uh, and as I mentioned, she's the co-lead for the, for the program here. We also have Dr. Catherine Matheson, who's uh, uh, also in the, uh, from the University of Ottawa. She's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and co-lead uh, of the program. She completed her medical school and residency training at Dalhousie. Uh, she has a special interest in, in this same area, and uh, clearly that's what we're going to learn about uh, today. So the title of their presentation is Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health, and I'll hand it over to our presenters. <coughs> Hi, everyone. So thanks so much for having us join today. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, as Dr. Duffy mentioned, I'm Lara Postal, um, and I'm co-presenting with Catherine Matheson on the topic of infant and early childhood mental health. Um, so Catherine and I um, are both child and adolescent psychiatrists. We have a special interest in working um, with early childhood mental health, and we're currently co-leads of the um, early childhood mental health team at CHEO. Um, and we're happy to talk with you today a bit about our team and the work that we're doing in our program. So in terms of our objectives, we wanted to spend a few minutes um, reviewing attachment and in our view, the importance of early childhood mental health. Um, and then we wanted to certainly spend some time talking about our uh, early childhood mental health program as we're just coming out of our pilot year. Um, and so we'll be reviewing how clinicians can refer to us, our inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then an overview of what um, we're up to on the team. And finally, we wanted to review the treatments we're providing um, with a particular focus on parent-child interaction therapy as our primary intervention. Um, and we know people may not be too familiar uh, with that intervention. Um, so we thought it would be a great opportunity to be able to provide an overview of, of what it entails. Um, and so if you were to uh, refer to our team, you'd have a sense of what it's all about and what we're doing. Um, so we, we're planning to cover quite a bit of ground, but we'll certainly make sure to leave some time uh, for questions at the end. <clears throat> so to get us thinking about early childhood mental health, we thought we would just start with a definition. So it is the developing capacity of the child from birth to six years of age to form close and secure adult and peer relationships experience, manage, and express a full range of emotions, and explore the environment and learn. And of course, that's all within the context of family, community, and culture. So this is a somewhat simple slide, but we think an important one. Um, so a reminder that early experiences matter in terms of their impact on brain development, and um, that the foundation of mental health is built early in life. So we believe that supporting parents and children early can really have a significant impact on mental health outcomes. Um, and that's why we feel so strongly um, that being able to provide early intervention for families who need it is so important. Um, and that's what our team is really um, hoping to be able to achieve. So many of you know about, may have expertise with attachment, but again, we wanted to just review the definition um, as when we're seeing families on our team, we're really thinking about them through, the, through an attachment lens or from an attachment perspective. So attachment is a system of behaviors that are designed to achieve physical proximity to a preferred caregiver. Um, and that's at times when the child is distressed or seeking comfort, nurturance or protection. So when children are distressed or seeking comfort um, from a caregiver, that's when we say the attachment system is activated. And the system is always balanced with exploration. So when a child is feeling safe and secure, they're able to go out into the environment and explore and learn. Um, and we know that secure attachment relationships really are fundamental to healthy brain development and emotional health. <clears throat> So in our work with families, it really is all about the relationship. 
Um, we see the relationship uh, as the buffer or the biggest protective factor for kids. Um, and these are some of the principles from the Circle of Security Parenting Group, which we think apply really nicely to attachment-based interventions in general. So we know that learning occurs within that secure base relationship. And again, the child really needs to feel secure in order for that learning and exploration to happen. We also know that lasting change happens through strengthening that relationship um, and through parents developing specific relationship capacities. So in, again, strengthening the relationship, that's really where the shift happens. And we need that strong foundation before any other intervention can really be effective. So even for instance, behavioral or skills-based approaches. Um, it's also really important, uh, we think, to know that the quality of the attachment uh, relationship is amenable to change. So we know that we can support and approve um, attachment security through providing an intervention for families. So I just wanted to highlight some of the general principles of attachment-based interventions um, as they apply to the work that we're doing on our team. So uh, these interventions are always dyadic. They always involve the caregiver and child together. Um, so we're never treating the, the child or parent um, in isolation from one another. Um, we're always treating the relationship. Um, so we like to say the relationship is the patient, um, so to speak. Um, so most of the interventions that we use also work to improve reflective capacity in the parent or caregiver. So that's really a key piece to building that attachment security in the relationship. Um, and so what is it? Uh, parental reflective function really includes understanding. So a parent understanding that there's meaning and intention behind their child's signals or behaviors. So it involves them being able to see their child as separate from themselves and in them developing um, an understanding of their own mental state or emotional state and how this might impact how they react to their child. So having a developed reflective capacity um, is one of the key pieces in promoting attachment security. <clears throat> and then the goal of the intervention is ultimately to improve that relationship security. And again, why is that important? Um, because we believe that securely attached relationships are protective for mental health and brain development in general. And then secure attachment also contributes to a child's resiliency. So we know it's that attachment relationship that buffers or protects um, against stress for kids. So we talked a bit about the importance of parental reflective function in building that attachment security, but how do we as clinicians teach a parent about what it is? Um, I just always like to say, first of all, it's not your job, it's not our job to try to fix the relationship. Um, to begin with, the intervention itself is really to observe the interaction, how parents are supporting their child, and then really help them to be able to reflect through providing you know, examples and modeling and support. Um, so we always start by observing parental responsiveness, um, observing the parent's insight into their child's behavior. We like to observe how the parent and child regulate and whether the parent can help the child to regulate. And we're also gonna look for signs of toxic stress in the relationship. Again, not to fix, but to have an understanding of what might be happening and why. We can support uh, interactions and support building some reflection, reflective function. And we know that if you can support the parent, then through that, you are definitely supporting the child. Um, just as an example, um, in terms of modeling, one reflective question uh, that I like to ask parents when meeting with them, and especially if you're seeing a behavior come up in front of you in the office, um, we like to ask, what do you think your child is needing from you right now? And that helps to get at what the underlying attachment need might be and helps the parent to get away from reacting um, and, and helps them to start to reflect. So how does taking a reflective stance as a clinician support healthy attachment? Well, I show this slide um, really to demonstrate that actually a lot is happening in these interactions um, when we as clinicians are taking um, a reflective stance. So when we model that reflective capacity for parents, um, we're teaching them to reflect on their child and their own emotions and mental state. Um, and reflecting on a parent's experience is very validating for the parent and helps them actually to be able to organize and make sense of their own feelings and experience. So through this process, 
we're actually helping the parent to regulate. And so we call that co-regulation. We're co-regulating with them. And we know that co-regulation is hugely important in building that relationship security as well. So children need the adults in their lives to help them to organize and regulate their emotions. Um, and in helping a parent to regulate through providing that reflective, non-judgmental support and validation, um, you're really supporting the parent and being able to do that for the child. So we know when the parent is regulated, the child is regulated and vice versa. When the parent is dysregulated, the child is dysregulated. Um, so we know by taking that moment or time to reflect on the parent's experience, you're really providing, we are, you are really providing a meaningful intervention uh, that also positively impacts the parent-child relationship. So um, we talked about taking a reflective stance and how that supports healthy attachment. But another attachment intervention that um, we really like to teach parents is special time. And some of you may do um, a different variation of that. Um, and, and so we'll just talk a little bit about how what we might prescribe special time for families. Um, we know that regular special time supports attachment security. And we would say this is probably one of the most useful interventions to promote healthy attachment um, that you can teach a parent to do at home. And it really applies to any and all families um, and can be done with a wide age group of kids um, with using different activities. So there's a number of um, important pieces for the key elements uh, that go in or key elements that go into prescribing special time. So I'll go over them briefly here and then Catherine is going to touch on this again um, as this is an important component of uh, treatment in parent-child interaction therapy as well. So just briefly, um, when we are prescribing special time, we prescribe it for five minutes a day, every day. Um, we know five minutes is enough to promote lasting change. We know the parent is much more likely to do it if it isn't too long. And we know in order to see consistent changes or shifts, it needs to occur at least five times a week, um, though ideally seven days. So essentially that's the dose. Um, it's helpful if it's the same time every day. Um, as the child knows what to expect, when it will happen, and it's much more likely to happen if it's part of a consistent routine. So sometimes we'll tell a parent to plan it around an event like a meal or bath time. Um, it involves a parent or caregiver and child alone. So we want to focus on that relationship and the interaction between the two of them. So if there's two caregivers, they would each do this separately. Uh, no siblings. Ideally, no distractions from TV or phone during that five minute period. Um, so special time also involves play, of course, and the play in this circumstance is always child led. So we gives the child the opportunity to have the lead over the interaction. And we know kids don't always have the opportunity to take the lead. Um, and so giving the child the lead can actually help to reduce the need for control in other situations. We want the parent or caregiver to follow the child's lead. So this actually shows the child that the parent has some genuine interest in, in them um, in what they're interested in, how they might do things. And this in itself can actually help to build that reflective capacity in the parent as they start to see or experience their child a bit differently. We really want to avoid the negative during this five minute period. So we ask parents to ignore anything annoying or provocative that happens. Um, and we, we just really don't wanna give focus to those behaviors or get into negative interactions during this time. Um, usually kids don't act out because they love it. Um, but obviously we tell a parent or caregiver to stop if the play is dangerous or aggressive. Um, and then we would tell the child why we're stopping and to try again the next day. So, it's important that we never remove special time as a consequence for behavior um, because the play itself is the intervention or the medicine, so to speak. The interaction is meant to be fun. We want there to be shared delight. We want um, there to be an experience of enjoyment. Um, and for some families, it's been a while um, since they might have been able to enjoy each other's company. And consistency is key. So if children know that they're gonna get the play daily and that time with their parent daily or caregiver daily, that will really fill their cup. And, and then they can make it to the next play time to be filled up again, um, knowing that it's coming. And we also see this leading to less clinginess or attention seeking overall. 
So we think anyone can promote this or um, prescribe this in their office and we think it's a really useful intervention. So I just wanted to touch briefly on the importance of early mental health promotion, prevention and intervention. Um, so keeping in mind, of course, there's different levels of need, different levels of intervention. Um, you know, really the goal is to try to identify issues early when we can and then prevent or intervene before we progress. Um, you know, to a stage of what we might call red flags, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, so why is, is that important? I mean, again, you know, as I've already sort of touched on, um, attachment security really does have longstanding implications um, for future mental health outcomes. And we know that that early promotion and strong parent-child relationship really is an important piece for all families. <clears throat> So when we think about red flags for early childhood mental health, we might think about some of the following. Um, so could be child protection concerns, um, parent caregiver has an intensely negative view of the child. Um, another red flag would be behaviors that have become so dangerous or aggressive that the parent really can't implement any strategies to support the child. If we see severe dysregulation or mental health concerns in the parent or caregiver. And obviously that might be a circumstance where we might suggest the parents seek out their own treatment or support. And then um, we would think about referral whenever there's significant behavioral or emotional concerns with a history um, of, that of, of disrupted relationships, disrupted attachment or relational trauma. Um, so these might be considered higher need um, kids or families and might be situations you would consider referring um, for children's mental health intervention. So with these concepts in mind, we'll shift to speaking a bit about our um, infant and early childhood mental health team and what we've been working on. So I'll touch on all of these different pieces as we go through. I'll just mention that our, it says one year pilot project. So our pilot year was officially last year. So started in January, 2020 and ended in December. So we're just now coming out of that pilot year and getting ourselves um, up and running. So this is our team. Um, so uh, of course, myself and Catherine, we're both psychiatrists and co-leads of the team. And we have a psychologist, Claire Nej Matsui, and two social workers, Anne Carriage and Usha Shri Kumar. So we're very lucky to have a multidisciplinary team with um, lots of knowledge and experience. Who do we serve? So in terms of our inclusion criteria, um, we provide specialized assessment and treatment for kids aged zero to six um, with complex emotional or behavioral concerns. So essentially we accept referrals for anyone before their sixth birthday, if we receive the referral before their sixth birthday. So presenting concerns might include things such as uncontrollable temper tantrums, severe defiance or aggression, um, extreme shyness or difficulty separating from a parent, um, behavioral patterns that might affect daily functioning like sleeping, feeding or toileting, um, could be concerns about anxiety or mood. Um, but the focus of our team really is children presenting with those symptoms or concerns. Um, but in the context of issues related to attachment and bonding or parent-child relationship difficulties, as that's really what our treatments target. So in terms of our exclusion criteria, um, we have been accepting kids um, with high functioning or level one autism. In general, uh, these children might come to our team if they've already received some behavioral intervention and it's felt that they might benefit from more support um, from an attachment or relationship perspective. Um, our interventions generally would not be a great fit for kids who are designated to be level two or three on the autism spectrum. For those kids, we probably would suggest referral to specific autism services. Um, similarly with kids with um, developmental delay or intellectual disability, we might um, suggest referral to specialized services for those kids as well. Um, what we don't do, um, we don't do trauma specific treatment um, or case management. So if the symptoms that the child is presenting with seem to be related um, to a specific trauma, 
um, and really seem to be around that, that trauma piece, um, then probably we would suggest trauma treatment, such as trauma-focused CBT, um, as opposed to intervention with our team. That being said, of course, we are often seeing families where there is a history of chronic developmental or relational trauma, because we know, of course, the attachment relationship is often significantly affected for those families. Um, so what services do we offer? So we provide um, a multi-step comprehensive assessment. And our goal is really to have a multidisciplinary approach um, with different team members involved in supporting the assessment. Um, so the assessment is quite involved um, and um, there are a few different components. Um, the first is uh, we do an attachment interview with the parent or caregiver. That's called the working model of the child interview. And really that interview aims to get at the parent's experience of their own childhood relationships. And we're really interested in how that impacts their relationship with their own child, um, because we know um, that attachment styles often are multi-generational. Um, we then do an attachment assessment or an observational component called the Kroll procedure. So again, that's a clinical assessment. Um, so it involves observing the parent and child in a number of interactions together. So often free play, cleanup, structured teaching, and then also a separation reunion. And then through observing those different components, we can gather information about the relationship, of course. And then finally, we provide um, a comprehensive case formulation with the team. And then we um, feed that back to families with recommendations. And of course, would provide feedback back to referring clinicians as well. Um, so we provide a number of evidence-based interventions. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on them here. Um, so we parent-child interaction therapy, of course, Catherine's gonna talk about that in quite a bit more detail. Um, we do, we have clinicians who offer dyadic developmental psychotherapy, watch, wait, and wonder. Um, those are both dyadic relationship-based models. Um, in the past, we've offered circle of security parenting group, and we can also offer specific consultations with psychiatry and psychology. Um, generally speaking, those specific consultations um, are for families who are already involved with treatment on our team, as, to as opposed to a separate sort of referral stream to those, those consults. Um, in the past, we've offered Circle of Security, but there are a number of community partners give, providing that group. And so moving forward, it may be that we refer out to the community for that. Ultimately, we'd also really like to be able to provide case consultation with our community partners, um, as we feel it would be important for our, us all to support each other in the work we're doing with this population. So this is our process map. I'll just very briefly describe it, um, although we've touched on a few of the pieces already. Um, I'll just mention in terms of our capacity for a pilot year, we estimated being able to see about 20 to 30 patients total for the year on our team. And we had just over 30 referrals um, with the pilot year again, ending in December. Um, currently each clinician on our team has the equivalent of one day per week dedicated to the program and the team. So we um, are limited in terms of resources. However, we're very much hoping to be able to expand um, our capacity as we move forward. So in terms of um, referral sources, we are currently now taking referrals from any CHEO physician, uh, as well as referrals that come through our general outpatient mental health referral process. So essentially to make a referral, um, you can send it through centralized mental health intake and the family would be contacted for an intake interview. Um, and then of course, if they um, were appropriate for our team, um, they would then um, come to us. Um, and the, prior, the first step would be the multidisciplinary assessment and then referral to treatment with our team if, if it fit and made sense to do that. Um, and then of course, we're always looking at external referrals or resources if needed for those families. So I will now pass it over to Catherine. She's gonna speak a little bit more about our interventions and again focusing on um, parent-child interaction therapy in a bit more detail. Thanks Lara. 
Um, so what we offer within our program for interventions are all focused on the relationship for the reasons Laura mentioned. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we offer and then focus the majority of the rest of our time on parent-child interaction therapy. Um, dyadic developmental psychotherapy or DDP is a psychotherapy where the clinician, caregiver and child are all in a room together and it's really focusing on the parent's reflective capacity. Um, it was developed by Dan Hughes and uses the acronym PACE. So the therapist is really promoting the caregiver's playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And really it's an approach to help shift that um, caregiver reflective capacity as well as ultimately the relationship and interactions. Watch, Wait, Wonder was developed in Toronto um, and again, is a dyadic therapy where the therapist is in the room with the caregiver and the child. And it's really focused on increasing that reflective capacity of the parent. The therapist often takes a stance um, of wondering about the parent's experience, the child's experience, and it really gets back to that modeling and validating sequence uh, that Dr. Postal mentioned that can be really helpful. For DDP and Watch, Wait, Wonder, there's no prescribed number of sessions. It's often based on the child's symptoms and how the relationship is functioning. Um, Circle of Security is an attachment-based parent group. So it's just for the parents. Um, it's eight weeks for approximately 60 to 90 minutes each week. Um, and as opposed to traditional psychoeducation groups, which are usually skills-based or working on helping the parents understand what's happening with their child and then how to respond appropriately. Circle of Security is really an experiential group. So it's part psychoeducation, part psychotherapy for the parents because a lot of that focus is on how they were parented, how they're parenting their child, what emotions were safe. And it really digs deep to understand sort of the core attachment principles and how they're playing out in real life. Um, Circle of Security, I mean, all of these have good evidence because Circle of Security was so successful. We've run it at CHEO about six or seven times now. Um, we were very pleased when community groups actually got trained in it last year. So even with COVID, um, Crossroads Children's Treatment Center and Parent Resource Center are two community agencies offering this group online to parents, um, which is wonderful that more parents can access it. Um, and then PCIT is really what we're going to focus on today. Um, this is a really exciting intervention because it probably has the most evidence of any behavioral intervention for children who are struggling with mental health problems. Um, and we're the first group in Canada who's been trained in it. So we're going to talk a little bit more about it today because it is our primary intervention and talk about the benefits and how it's different from the other things that we offer. Um, so what is parent-child interaction therapy? Uh, it is an evidence-based treatment for children with disruptive behavior disorders. So it was initially designed for children between age two and seven um, with disruptive behavior disorders. Since that time, it's expanded uh, for older children as well as other diagnoses. So it was really those ADHD and ODD kids, if we're talking about diagnoses, that it was originally shown to be helpful for. However, since that time, there's been a number of our randomized controlled trials that have shown effectiveness with other populations, including conduct disorder, uh, pediatric bipolar disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, the child maltreatment or abuse population has strong evidence, um, anxiety disorders, and there is some um, intellectual disability and autism spectrum studies as well. Uh, so, the evidence is robust, and we'll be talking a little bit about a recent meta-analysis near the end of the presentation. So what does it look like and how does it actually work? Families typically complete PCIT within 12 to 14 weeks. So it is time limited, but it's, it progresses at the rate that the family progresses. So there's two phases, a child-directed phase and a parent-directed phase. So the family will not progress to the next phase or the PDI phase until they've mastered the CDI phase. Um, so there are specific skills and strategies that they need to be able to demonstrate consistently before they can move to the next phase. And that's helpful because 
um, as we'll talk about, it's really important to have mastery in the CDI skills before you can move on to PDI or what we think of sort of the discipline portion of the therapy. So let's talk about CDI or the child directed phase first. Um, this is a part of the treatment where really we're looking for the child to lead the play. The, we teach the parent pride skills. So there's always one sort of quote unquote didactic session at the beginning where the clinician teaches the parent the skills that they want to, them to focus on. And then there's also an element of differential reinforcement, which is sort of typical behavior modification. So the pride skills are labeled praise, reflections, imitation, description, and enjoyment. Uh, so we use acronyms to help parents remember, but to get into the details, what a label praise is, is not just saying good job um, or other sort of vague unlabeled praises. Really what we want the parent to do is let the child know exactly what they're doing or what behavior they're doing that the parent likes. And we know that that is gonna increase the chance that the child's gonna repeat the behavior in the future. Reflection is really about paraphrasing or reflecting back what the child is saying. Part of that is because it really lets the child lead the conversation. And it's also a validating experience for the child because it shows them that their caregiver is listening to them and what they're saying is valuable enough for the caregiver to repeat it back or paraphrase it. Imitation refers to um, the fact that we want the caregiver to really follow the child's lead and do what they're doing. So there are certain, I mean, depending on the setting, there are certain PCIT approved toys that we put out for the child. And then the child selects what toy they play. And we really ask the caregiver to do what the child's doing and imitate what they're doing. Again, that's a validating experience for the child to have their caregiver so interested in playing with them alongside them with whatever they choose to play with. As the caregiver is playing with the child, we really want them to describe what they're doing. Um, so we call these behavior descriptions while we're coding them. And basically the analogy we use to help parents understand is it's sort of like a sports announcer. We want the parent to describe what is happening and what the child's doing. Again, it's a great experience for the child to, to know that their parent's focus is completely on them and they approve what they're doing. Uh, and then obviously enjoyment is the other key component uh, in terms of a corrective emotional experience to strengthen the attachment for both the caregiver and the child. So for the label praises, the reflections and behavior descriptions, what we do as therapists is actually code literally how many of each the caregiver is doing in a specified period of time. And they need to hit mastery and hit a certain level before we can move on to the next section. Um, along with these skills, we also work on that differential attention. Um, so there's no commands, no questions, no negative criticism. At the same time, we really want to praise opposite behavior. So during our therapy sessions, which are typically an hour in length, if the child is acting out, it really is about as soon as the child then does an appropriate behavior, we want to immediately label praise what they do. So an example might be if the child and parent are playing Lego together and the child starts doing a behavior that typically leads to trouble, like throwing the Lego or hiding. As soon as the child starts um, interacting in a way that's appropriate that we want to see, the parent really has to praise that shift. Um, for example, saying, thank you for coming back to the table. Thank you for using the Lego gently. Um, some sort of recognition that the child's shift in behavior um, is really positively received by the caregiver. We do warn parents, and I'm sure all you guys know as pediatricians, that typically behavior gets worse before it gets better. Um, so kids, especially be between the age of two and seven, are really looking to push those limits, um, especially when they're met with resistance. So that's where the consistency comes in and the coaching sessions are particularly helpful. Uh, we ignore any attention seeking behavior that's not aggressive or destructive during the sessions and also during special time. So we really need to get these CDI skills solid before we can move on to PDI or the parent directed phase of treatment. And some parents wanna go straight for the discipline phase. They wanna learn those strategies to help 
contain their child, um, but we really focus on CVI. And that's because we need the child to lead the play as this increases the likelihood of those positive sustainable interactions at the beginning of treatment. Ultimately, the skills learned in CDI are the behavior management strategies that you want caregivers to use the vast majority of the time. Um, we really find that strengthening that caregiver child attachment will increase compliance in the long run. So each week we work on these CDI skills in therapy. Um, a typical session looks like five minutes of coding where we um, record that literally record the number of reflections, behavior descriptions, and label praises the parent has, as well as any commands, questions, or negative comments. And then we actually coach them in the moment um, to work on these skills. Once they sort of, part of what their practice is between sessions is that special time. So it's a pretty intensive therapy. It's an hour a week. And then we ask them for five minutes of special time a day. And during those five minutes of special time, they're practicing their CDI skills. So hopefully as they progress through the treatment, they've reached mastery and then we can move on to PDI. But to be honest, I would say that the families we've seen, about 90% of the behaviors get sort of cleaned up during the CDI phase. So really when parents are practicing special time daily and actually doing it um, and attending therapy each week, you can see the difference. So the relationship is improved. The child is receiving positive feedback on behaviors through the parent's use of pride skills. The planned ignoring really helps extinct those negative attention-seeking behaviors. And we do see a generalization of skills. So even though the parent is only practicing those pride skills five minutes, it really spills over um, and has a big impact on the child's behavior. Um, so honestly, this what we do when we're monitoring symptoms is we use the Iberg um, Child Inventory of Behaviors or ECBI. And most of the kids are coming down um, under the clinical range during the CDI phase of treatment. So the, their behaviors no longer meet criteria um, for sort of that clinical uh, disorder. So certainly CDI is effective, um, but once they master their CDI skills, uh, we move on to PDI, which is the parent-directed phase of treatment. So in this phase, it's really the parent that leads the play and we work on effective commands and a timeout procedure. The important part about PDI is that it's consistent, predictable, and follow through is key. Um, so really what this provides is structure for the child Discipline is always provided for the undesired behavior. The child learns what to expect and how it happens. So there's a very specific sequence of events um, that happen in terms of compliance and eventually potentially the timeout procedure. And then there's follow through. So the child learns that no matter what, they have to comply with the original command. And the thing that really makes it effective is that this is coaching in the moment with the parents. So many parents, it's easy, and there are lots of parenting programs out there, such as Incredible Years, Triple P, that have good evidence, but really what they're doing is educating parents on these are the strategies you should use, now go use them, good luck. Um, the difference with PCIT is that we're actually in the moment coaching the families. So in person, we have a one-way mirror at our clinic and a bug in the ear so that the caregiver and the child are in the room interacting and we're literally coaching them in the moment um, every few seconds, depending what they're doing. With COVID, we've shifted to virtual coaching. So what will happen is we'll do Zoom calls through CHEO. The parent will have um, an earbud or headphones so the child won't be able to hear what we're saying. We turn off our camera so it's not distracting. We watch the play and feed um, in the moment feedback or directions to the caregiver um, as things play out. So it's really helpful because even though we teach the caregivers the skills at the beginning of PDI, it's really hard for a lot of them to follow through, be consistent. So having that coach in the moment gives them 
um, the confidence to be able to do this at home. And that's really what we're looking for is generalizability so that the parent isn't just doing what they need to do in our sessions, but they can actually carry that home and then eventually out into the community. So it provides the child with, with multiple opportunities to respond to these effective commands we've been working on. There's, and then depending how that goes, there's either contingent praise or a timeout sequence. Every timeout is a very consistent sequence of events. Even the language that's used is exactly the same every single time, so the child knows what to expect. There's prepared responses for timeout refusal. Throughout all of this, there's co-regulation with the therapist and the parent so that the parent can help co-regulate the child in these moments. And then there's gradual generalization from compliance in coaching sessions to real life commands in the home and then in the community. So timeout has gotten a bad reputation over the years. Um, in PCIT, timeout is a very specific entity um, that's brief. So again, it's predictable. It's always three minutes plus five seconds of quiet at the end. It's really the child's behavior that signals when to get off the chair. Um, the other thing is that it's structured. So it's the same language. The child knows what to expect. Um, and there's always the specific command, do not get up off the chair until the time is done. Um, and really what timeout is, and I think a lot of times when timeout gets a bad reputation, people imagine kids who are dysregulated um, being sent away. And really timeout is supposed to be a removal of that attention, um, but not necessarily sort of a, dismissiveness of the child's emotional experience. So often what we suggest is there's actually a timeout chair in the room with the caregiver. So even though the caregiver isn't necessarily attending to the child, they're still with the child in their emotional experience. Circle of security would call it being with. So they're still in proximity, they're still present, and they're still sort of a, a regulator for the child. They're just not giving them attention until that um, timeout sequence is over. So really the coaching part, you can imagine, especially during a timeout sequence, um, is key for PCIT. And this is why, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think it's so effective and why it works so well with the families we work with, is it really provides the caregiver with live feedback while they're interacting with the child. So instead of breaking down an interaction after the fact and saying, okay, try this next time, we're actually seeing it in the moment and correcting it in the moment. And it gives the caregiver an opportunity to practice and get that feedback immediately. Um, so it looks different. It's a different type of therapy. It's quite active. So approximately every five seconds, we're coaching and giving um, direct feedback or an instruction to the parent. So it's active, but it's predictable. And really it's a similar thing we're doing for the parent that we hope that the parent is doing for the child. Oh, I see, we better wrap things up. So let me go through the rest. So if anyone's interested in learning more about PCIT or seeing what it actually looks like, um, we have lots of clips of ourselves offering the therapy to families who have signed consent forms. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying PCIT has by far the best evidence out there. There was a recent meta-analysis in pediatrics. Um, and to be honest, it's interesting. In the U.S., a lot of governments and Head Start agencies have invested in PCIT because the evidence is so robust. Again, we're the first group in Canada to offer it. So it's quite exciting. Um, basically, the data is quite impressive. Um, whether you're looking at child externalizing behaviors, parenting stress, even recidivism for maltreatment, um, PCIT has shown to be effective across the board. Um, so it's something, it's a big part of what we offer our children and we find it works really well, but I will wrap up because I know people probably have some questions. So thank you very much to uh, Laura and Catherine for their excellent presentation. I'm sure there are Lots of questions. I, I couldn't help but think as, as you were going through that uh, this is a very time intensive uh, um, program. And I'm just wondering uh, from a process perspective, how many families you can actually manage say over the course of a year. And, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the outcome and effect, 
uh, given the time commitment to individual caregivers and so on. You alluded to, you know, playtime, et cetera, being necessary between the caregiver and the single child. What about in situations where there are multiple children in the families and the practical aspects of that? So maybe you could just comment a little bit about that. Sure, I can start. It's a great question. And oftentimes, so once we see a family um, and do our comprehensive assessment, we give them the multidisciplinary formulation with them. So we'll say, this is what we're seeing. This is what we think is happening. And this is what we think would be helpful. If we think PCIT is an intervention that would be effective for a family, we really switch into a motivational interviewing stance and really get a sense of does this match up with what the parents' goals? How motivated are they to work on this? How much time do they realistically have to put into this? Because you're right, if they're not able to commit to once a week plus the five minutes of special time, really there's no point in starting. So we're quite upfront about the intensiveness of the therapy and the commitment required. Um, sometimes that will serve to bolster motivation and people are thankful for the service and sometimes they weed themselves out and we find an intervention that might be more effective for their needs. Um, so realistically, um, when we deal with a lot of families, single parent families, multiple children, every family is a little bit different. So some parents, if they're motivated and they, the nice thing is they see the effects pretty quickly. Um, so if they notice the behaviors are increasing significantly, um, that further motivates them to continue on with therapy. And sometimes we have families waking up the affected child or patient five minutes before the rest of the kids. Other families offer um, the five minutes a day to all the children. Again, it really depends on everyone's um, access to other caregivers or babysitting services or how they balance it out with the other siblings. Um, we're usually not proponents of screen time, but this is the one instance where we give parents permission to put the other kids in front of the TV or the iPad while they spend the five minutes of special time with this child. Um, so we get creative, but certainly there are barriers to a program this intensive. Thank you. Toby? This is wonderful. I'm totally thrilled. So thank you for presenting this and thanks for the um, uh, bringing this to Chio. Um, so I'm really excited to see where um, this could go as you kind of build your capacity. Um, have you noticed a difference in, because um, I was reflecting on the same things Dr. Duffy was about the barriers for parents to, um, to participate. And have you noticed a difference since you switched over to Zoom? Because I mean, that would help a lot in terms of, you know, for example, being in person versus a finding a babysitter for the other six kids um, to be able to, to come to this. And also, I think, you know, the particularly for the parent centered portion might benefit other children in the, the parenting piece for the other children, in the family, because sometimes it's there's more than one sibling in the family that maybe is having um, issues. And then I guess the second part of my question is, is there any evidence emerging about a like a, a mini version or something that, for example, you might start to see benefits after, let's say three sessions or something like that for families um, that um, maybe can't commit to the full 14 weeks that um, there might still be some benefit to be found in even a, um, a shorter intervention. And part three being, what's your big picture vision for the capacity piece of, you know, are we training everyone to be able to do this? Are we training family dogs? Are we training, um, our pediatric residents, uh, what are you sort of thinking in um, being able to provide this um, for families in need? Because I'm sure that you guys are dealing with uh, the really high test cases, but there's a lot of families out there that struggle with these types of um, issues and would it, it potentially find this beneficial. Um, I can start and Catherine, feel free to jump in. I think it's funny because um, with COVID, I mean, we were just getting started, like in terms of the virtual versus in person, we were just getting started with our in person sessions after having been trained. So we can't fully do a real comparison of sort of in person versus Zoom, but I can definitely say um, that a lot of the families, at least that I've been working with, really appreciate the Zoom format because, as you said, they're busy, it's hard to get the kids in, they've got multiple, you know, balls. In the air. So I think a lot of the families have found that to be really effective. And, you know, luckily, I think the PCIT group that, that we work with and that trained us very quickly adapted the model to be able to be provided virtually. So we were able to learn that quickly and implement it. 
it. Um, and so far it seems to be working really nicely. Um, and I think most of our team members have had that um, experience. And I would um, echo that just sorry before we move on from the zoom question we did probably about five or six rounds of circle of security parenting group in person and then we had uh, two I think zoom rounds and certainly with this population there's a lot of social determinants of health at play and the attrition rate for these types of interventions is quite high in the literature between 30 and 50% so very high. Our attrition rate with the Zoom group was significantly smaller. And I think you're right, just being able to reach people in their homes, they don't have to worry about transportation, childcare, the kids were running around, um, was really sort of an unintended consequence of shifting to virtual. So certainly I think for this population, it's gonna work moving forward. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, I'll no, let you. Okay. Um, yeah, no, exactly. I, I, and so I think the second part was just around asking, like, is there modifications for shorter courses of treatment? And um, there, it, it, not really in so much as it's really based on building those skills. So for each family, you sort of have to go through the skills building to get to the next phase. But some families do that much more quickly than others if they are doing the homework in between the five minutes a day. Um, so, you know, what I would say to that, though, is um, there are some families where I know they're not going to be able to do the full piece, but I will do some, um, I guess coaching is the wrong word, I will do some educational sessions to teach them some of the elements of PCIT without doing the whole um, process, because I think even the, the CDI, like as we said, special time piece is something that everyone can do. So I, with some families, I will leave them with that piece to really get going. Um, and to try to implement that. Um, and then sometimes what we see is, is parents might say, you know what, we can't do it now, it's too much. But then as the behaviors continue, they say, actually, now I'm ready. Um, and so that's sort of tends to be how it might go. Um, but we do, I guess I do a bit of modification. I just, we don't call it PCIT then, it's more sort of the educational skills building approach. Um, but uh, that does sort of certainly um, condense it. Um, and just the, the final piece I'd say about that is um, it is really intensive, but the idea being that um, if parents can can stick with it and do it and, and do the whole process, the odds of them needing to come back are so much lower, right? So we often see families like trying different things and then feeling that it's not working and then needing to come back. And so our, our hope and that what, what it shows in the research for PCIT is if people do it, really, you know, they can continue on with that and they might just need sort of boosters along the way, um, but it can be effective in the long term. And that's really our goal. And that it, it also could be used with siblings. So if we teach it to a parent, Parent with one child, we say to them, use this, you can now do this with all of your children, right? It's the same approach, it's consistent, and it's actually ideal if that's the case, because then everyone is, is sort of going through the same process at home. The other benefit of the intensivity is that parents notice like marked improvements in symptomatology very quickly, which again, really bolsters that motivation to continue on because they're noticing such huge changes after just a couple of weeks of CDI and special time. Um, so that's often enough motivation for them to sort of put in the work. Um, and jumping to your third question, Toby, about capacity, um, as I'm sure you guys are stretched, so is our mental health care system. So we all know that the Ministry of Health hasn't, um, funded this program or resourced it in any way. So what we've done is we've pulled various clinicians from other areas of mental health to make this team work because we truly believe that if we intervene early, we can change the trajectory and hopefully decrease the burden on the downstream mental health services. So, and unfortunately, as mental health changes, for example, our psychologist has now been seconded to eating disorders. So it's always a shifting balance, but because of the success of our pilot year, we're hoping to obtain funding to increase our capacity. Um, so I would say stay tuned on that. We'll be having some upcoming meetings about how, what that's gonna look like scaling up and um, who are gonna collaborate in terms of being able to resource that scale up. So stay tuned, but we hope it's gonna happen. Exactly. And we would love for other clinicians to get trained in PCIT mm -hmm. too. You asked about that. So that would be ideal if it was sort of more of a widespread um, approach. Uh, other questions? I don't see any there. I just have a question rather. This is an interesting program and clearly has the uh, opportunity for evaluation and scholarly work within the, within the program. And I just wonder if you might comment about uh, your any work that you have planned or are doing in, in, uh, in that regard? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly as we are a bit of a groundbreaking program in Canada, it would be really nice to incorporate that outcome evaluation as part of our work. So that's part of our scale up plan is to really embed that within our clinical program so that we can show efficacy and help um, basically tr transmit this knowledge and effectiveness. So currently we have a few small projects about circle of security and how our parent groups have gone. But certainly as we scale up, if there's any interest among your group or any suggestions, we are just beginning these conversations about how to incorporate research and scholarly work as an integral part of our program. That's great, good, good for you. Um, and then there may well be people uh, within the organization at large who, <coughs> who wish to, to uh, link with you in that regard. Uh, and there's always uh, support through the CRU, which is uh, um, there for your um, benefit and support. I don't see any other uh, hands up or any uh, 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 comments or questions in the chat. So with that, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you very, very much for your excellent presentation. This is a, a really interesting program. I'm sure it will have huge benefits and uh, uh, kudos to you for, for bringing it to us. Thank, Thank you. you for inviting us and feel free to reach out, email us anytime if anyone has further questions. Okay, take care. Thank you.